Thank you, Kim. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. It, it's, it's an honor to be here because COVID has us all separate for many years. So I know a lot of folks love getting back together. So it's good that we're starting to do this. And it's also good that we're talking about the future of cybersecurity. We're changing about the future of our conferences, right? So we have a virtual audience as well. So I think this is something that we'll see. It's even in our workforce. And when I, when I speak about this, I want to lead that into our future cybersecurity and what we need to start thinking about. So my goals for the day is it to be a conversation. I don't have a long talk. I don't want to bore you for an hour or drone on for an hour. So I want to have conversations with you. I want to cover some of my topics and challenges that I want to put out to you and hopefully invoke some thought or inspire you when you go back to your organizations. But I want a good portion of this speech for you to have time before we, get to, we can chat, right? So even if you have questions or not about anything I talked today, I welcome that because I, I wanted this to be open dialect. This is because that's how we succeed in cybersecurity is talking and communicating and building these networks. So the first thing I wanted to talk about with the future of cybersecurity is like, where are we at now? Um, we all could probably go around the room if we went to every table in here and we would start talking about some of the challenges we face or the issues we chase, and they would sound very similar. And the problem with that is we've been having these challenges and these problems for almost 20 years. So we all heard that quote of, you keep doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. It's the definition of insanity, right? I call it organized chaos because that's what cybersecurity works in. We work in organized chaos that's continually changing. And by the time this conference is over and we all leave and we get in our cars and we check our feeds that we look at, Twitter or wherever we get our feeds for cybersecurity, there's going to be something new, right? Open SSL just a few days ago, right? Log4j. There's always something new for us. It's one of the upsides of our, of our industry that we choose to work in. We don't get bored. I had one job when I worked in the federal government. The biggest decision I made in the day was, am I spinning in my chair to the left today or to the right today? And that was, that, they paid me well, but that's not challenging. So most people in cybersecurity, we're also like challenged. We like to be invoked. We like to be engaged, right? It's time to, that we can take that and start moving that beyond of what we're doing now. So the first thing I want to challenge us with as an industry, and in, in professionals industry, is the fundamentals. A lot of the challenges that we face right now are we are not doing the fundamentals. I'll tell you, every organization that I've been at, when I get in, I go, what do you want me to accomplish as your security leader? We want you to do security. Or the second one is, we want to be secure. As I've matured in my career, I now see that as a red flag. And I may ask other questions or maybe pass on the jobs. But I took those jobs because I was hungry and I wanted to build my career. And you get in there and they go, okay, what does doing security mean or being secure mean? As we all know, we can define it, we'll never be secure. I have uh, an organization that I consult with. Their CIO, told, it was a, it's a holding company, right? So the CIO, they have a centralized IT. So the CIO of this holding company told all the general managers of the holding companies, we can't be breached. We're unbreachable. He don't work there no more. <laughs> well, let me put it away. He retired. We know how that works, right? He wasn't fired. He was, he was invited to retire. Um, and they got breached after he said that. Uh, it was, it's a manufacturing company. So you can imagine if a plant goes down, what happens? Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. When I worked in the auto manufacturing, I worked for a tier three supplier. And we supplied the Ford truck plant in Louisville, Kentucky. And if you're not familiar with industry manufacturing, they do what's called real-time manufacturing. So when the Ford truck is going down the line at Ford, we made brakes and radiators. The radiator that is matched to a truck is getting made at the same time. They throw it on the truck, they drive it over to the plant, and when the truck gets to the point of the manufacturing line where it's time to put in a radiator, our radiators are being brought in. Okay? So they have SLAs, you can imagine. Ten minute downtime. After ten minutes, a thousand dollars a minute that you have Ford shut down because you shut Ford down. So you can understand the complexity of making sure those are secure, the integrity, and it works, right? You can imagine when you have a CIO of a holding company like that going, we can't be breached. End of story on that one, right? But anyway, back to the fundamentals. Looking at the fundamentals, we hear basic hygiene. We talk about adaption of frameworks. Every organization I've been at, they don't have it because they had that general Cybersecurity is a, a bolt-on. Cybersecurity is an afterthought. Cybersecurity, they don't understand it. 
So the first thing I want to challenge us as an industry to talk about is cybersecurity literacy, right? What are we doing as our part? We hear all the statements. We talk about it online. I've even posted about it, about how we got to talk to the board. We have to do this. We have to do that. We have to communicate with senior leadership. But we need to look back inside at ourselves and go, what are we doing to facilitate that conversation in providing the cybersecurity literacy that our board needs? Because we always look to our board or our CEOs, our leadership, and go, we need to have these risk conversations. We need to have... We need to quantify this. We need to do empirical data over here and, we, we, and all these things. And it's right. These are not inaccurate statements. But sometimes these folks don't know what to ask, right? They have one simple question. Are we safe? Are we secure? How are we doing cybersecurity? So it's our job to start working on cybersecurity literacy. So that's a future state that can get us to where we need to go. It's simple. Ask those conversations. And if you're not having the conversations with those leaders, reach out. One of the worst things about technology people, and this is where I get to throw in the joke, we're all introverts, right? A lot of technology folks aren't really extroverts. There's a few of us weird ones, and we're weird, right? But my joke is, how can you tell an introvert or from an extrovert cybersecurity person? Does anyone know the answer? Because it's not really a new joke. So an extrovert will look at your shoes when they talk to you, and an introvert looks at their shoes when they talk to you. Okay. <laughs> Just little. So. Um, but it, it really is paramount for us to have those conversations. So reach out and network. And that ties into the next part of where we're looking at with cybersecurity and where we need to go with cybersecurity. It doesn't happen in a bubble. It doesn't happen in a silo. We have to start looking at how these agile teams are being built. Start looking at how we integrate. There's other parts of industry and business that have been doing this for decades. It's time for us as cybersecurity leaders and cybersecurity practitioners to implement what's worked elsewhere. So how do we integrate our teams? We talk about cybersecurity should happen in a tribe, right, a community. How do we build those communities and tribes, and how do we integrate ourselves into that? How do we understand, we talk about getting a seat at the table. Well, how do we pull up a damn chair and sit at the table? How do we invite ourselves to that table? We have to start doing these things. But then when we get in there, it's conversation. So we're... We all could start talking about ones and zeros and bits and bytes, right, and hash and, and all the things that we talk about technical. When we walk into that other room, those words may mean something different to them. Or they may not understand those words, right? So one of the things that I'll share with you that I found that really helps me as a cybersecurity leader is if you have an organization that has a clearly documented goals or strategies, if they don't, it's challenging, but you can continue to lead that instructions by asking, what is our goals and strategies? But organizations that are fortunate enough and you're fortunate enough to work in that said, you can go to a web page, an internet page, a document that says, these are what we're trying to accomplish. Could be one thing, five things, could be a hundred things. You have to be a little creative now, but when you implement a cybersecurity control, or you ask for funding for a cybersecurity solution, you relate it back to that control. So I'll give you one easy example. Most universities go, we want to increase our student enrollment by 20%. It's like, well, what's that got to do with cybersecurity? Well, if you start talking about the web page where students get information, if you start talking about the online enrollment, right, you can, you can go, we know we need data loss prevention. And I'm making stuff up here, so don't, don't write this down. I'm just making it up as an example, right? But we need data loss prevention. We have a student enrollment system that captures data of students. So when you go, I really need to get data loss prevention, and I need it for the entire enterprise, but you can go, I'm going to take that one goal that's really important to them that they're talking about right now and go, if I get data loss prevention solution, I can protect this student data. I can protect the means the way student data is moved throughout our system and our things and whatever, right? And, it's, and then we will contribute to that 25% increase. Even if we talk about our reputation and how we protect FERPA data, student data. So you always have to put it in a language they understand. And, and I know that's a crazy example I made up, right? But that's where you have to start thinking, right? I'm, just, I'm, I'm putting the framework of the way you think about these things when you talk about it. So now from going, we've got this risk, and North Korea is going to turn off all our power, and the, and the thermometers in the fish tank will be hacked. You have to add that one line, right? Because it laughed because it happened, right? So... And I'll talk about that in a second, too. But you add that extra statement of, 
And here's how that contributes to this goal. And you'll be amazing to how the eyes open and they listen more because now you're talking their language. So we used to talk about how we want to teach them our language, but it's more about us learning their language. And when I say their, I'm talking about the senior leadership. And then it's taking that once we've established communication. And, and I'll give you my, my example of this. Everyone in here, if I asked, went out of the room, was like, if you had one wish to have one superpower, what would it be? Right? You could fly. Right? Super strength. Super smart. I've always wanted my superpower to be to be able to be fluent in every language ever. All I have to do is see it or read it, and I instantly know it, even if it's an ancient dead language that hasn't been seen for 10,000 years. And the reason why is because have you ever been out and talked to someone and been able to talk to them in their language and make that connection? There was a guy on YouTube, and he's passed away. His name was Mouse. He spoke numerous languages, and he would go into bazaars, or he'd travel to other countries, or he'd go to parts of, you know, like, you know, parts of town like Korean town, you know, and they have all these parts of towns where you have communities, and he would speak their language to them. So they welcomed him when he came in as a customer to their shop, but then he started talking to them in their language, and you could see the heart open, and the eyes open, and the warmth, and they related, and they connected. And that's the same thing we're looking for here. We need to make that connection is, and, and for the future of cybersecurity. Um, the other part is, we talked about, I mentioned the fish tank thermometer, right? That's my leeway into that. So when we talk about risk, that's the same thing. We got to tie that back to those goals. So all of it in here has done at least one risk assessment, right? Or has some kind of risk management program. How many of you would have ever put the fish tank thermometer as a critical risk and went to the CEO and said, Oh, no, you can't do that. Here's all this billions of dollars we got to spend on a thermometer because we're not speaking their language. That, that Internet of Things fish tank thermometer probably cost them $100, maybe less, right? They stuck it in the fish tank. And they go, what's the risk of that? Oh, none. It's, it's, it's wet, and it's in the fish tank, right? So that goes back to that language. When you are able to go, I need controls or I need to develop an Internet of Things cybersecurity program, and here's all the solutions I need to buy. Got a lot of vendors over here. They'll tell you there's the, they're the one to buy it from too, right? They all, they all are. It's just like when Log4j came out, they all knew how to fix Log4j. And your vendors, if you're in here, I'm sorry, but I'm just telling the truth. Zero trust, everything's zero trust now, and it's not, right? We know it's not a product. It's a, it's a concept. Um, but, the, but you would go in and go, I don't, you know, the CEOs will go, I don't don't understand the problem with this. Why do you want to spend a million dollars to protect this fish tank thermometer? Well, if you were able to speak to the CEO of that casino casino that suffered that breach, they'll tell you why, right? Let's go back a few more years. Let's talk about Target. Everyone remembers how Target was hacked, right? (laughs) Stolen credentials, HVAC system. Where will those fall normally if we follow the way we do risk management and risk assessment now? Where do you think those would have fell? Low, no risk, accept the risk. So learning the language and looking at the goals now allows you to talk about why you should spend a million dollars protecting a fish tank thermometer. And that's some of these areas of the challenges I want you to think about as we move forward in the future state. It's the same concept that we need to start getting past of let's do our risk assessments and let's do our crown jewels. Let's... uh, you know, asset management and having to identify everything you own is very important. But then we classify them. And we go, so if you're in a hospital, you've got your EHR system. That's the crown jewel. And it is. That's the heart of a hospital, if you're your EHR system. Everything flows in and out of it. If you've got researchers, they're wanting to put their hands in it, right? They want to pull data out of it. So we're going to spend a lot of money protecting our EHR system. But we forget the thermometer, well, we've learned over the last few years that I can breach my EHR system through my fish tank thermometer. So why do I need to invest in this? So I want folks, I always tell folks, and I'm an advocate of the NIST cybersecurity framework just because it's simple, and I've done a lot of work in, with regulatory compliance. So when the federal government says NIST, and I'm held to a lot of federal government compliances, well, I'm going to do the same language, right? I'm going to use NIST cybersecurity framework. I like it because it's a, if you're a carpenter, you ever heard measure many cut once? 
With NIST, you can measure many with one cut. It's the opposite, right? You can come in and go, here's how I'm meeting FERPA because I'm following this framework. Here's how I'm meeting HIPAA because I followed this framework. Here's how I'm meeting the IRS 1075 as Social Security Administrations, right? All the federal regulations. But now we can speak that language. So that's, I want you to start thinking about how do I holistically protect my environment and my enterprise? I have to protect everything. So if you develop a framework and you protect everything at the same level, you can still talk about how the EHR system is the most important. And we got a lot of eyes on it. We got flags and alerts set, right? And we got people ready to respond. We've got incident response plans. We got playbooks. But my fish tank thermometer is protected at the same level because it's all interfaces. And then we could get into segmentation and segregation, VLANs and all that stuff, right? And we should do that. But you should be able to talk to that. How am I protecting the entirety of the enterprise it will, instead of saying, I got to prioritize? And when you develop your solutions, we, we did a lot of budgeting where it's like, well, I'm going to spend a whole lot of money over here on the HR system. I'm going to spend $100 over here on the fish tank. Look at your solutions and look at your strategy as a whole. Go, how can I deploy these solutions where it protects everything? And then the importance of the board and the organization of what we speak about and with that common language. So to summarize the first part of my future speech is, we got to start doing the things we've been talking about for 20 years right now because we can't get to the future on a weak foundation. And a lot of us, a lot of organizations, it's not, it's not there's, there's some companies really doing it really well and there's companies doing it really bad. But on average, we all got a pretty shaky sound foundation. And I'm going to tell you, I've been doing it for almost 20 years, and I haven't gone to an organization yet where I walked in and went, oh, this job's going to be easy. <laughs> right? I walked in and went, what did I get myself into? They're not paying me enough. When's a, let me get back on LinkedIn and see what jobs open. Because the other challenge is, is budget, right? It's, we, but when you have those conversations, you can, you can incorporate the budget. You can start making the justification of why we need to spend more because you're relating it back to those goals. I've been at one organization where the first year I was there, it was like, it was one of those, we want to be secure. Okay. I did my thing, did my assessments evaluations, where we stand, where we strong, you know, all that same stuff, right? Spent six months of doing nothing. You're not doing any work because you're like trying to figure out where you're at and what's going on. So being parsimonious, <clears throat> I said for the first year, here's a budget to get us to where you said you want us to be, at least start going. And then I'll come up with a three to five year budget after that. First year, I went $1.5 million. Not a whole lot for most organizations. If you think about going over and buy some security tools, you could go over a vendor and they'll spend a million dollars. One booth over there will spend a million dollars for you, like today, right? They said, here's $40,000. So I went to LinkedIn that night because it takes about six months to find a new job. Um, but, you know, how do you make that work? And, and how did I negate that? So it was a learning experience because I didn't expect that because the conversation always been, give us your budget, do your analysis, I give them the budget, I expect the money to come. So I said, oh, we don't do budgeting here. We do wish listing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> that's great. But the second year, I had a better conversation with them. And I got a little bit more money. Still wasn't enough, right? And this was an organization that pulled in about $3.5 billion a year. So it wasn't hurting them. But, uh, but having that conversation. So these are, this is also from experience. When I changed the conversation, when I pulled the goals in and I related how even a fish tank thermometer would be a detrimental $2 million loss, I got more money, okay? Uh, I actually was able to even grow the team. I inherited a team of like three or four in that organization, and I grew them to 20 because they understood what I was talking about now, okay? Um, I still look for a new job, <laughs> uh, clearly. Um, so the second part of that is if we get that foundation in place, we quit doing things the wrong way. Uh, and if there's any CIOs in here, I'm sorry. I apologize to you up front. But we've looked to the CIO for almost 20 years for cybersecurity. How many times do you read a cybersecurity article online and it says, well, this CIO said this. Well, this CIO priorities, if you like Gartner, and not Dog and Gartner, but there's just one everybody knows, like the Gartner CIO cybersecurity strategy. I'm like, why do you keep talking to the CIO? Right? So those are some of the other things that we need to start changing. We, when we start building that trust, we can move that future of cybersecurity. I'm a big advocate of the separation. You probably, if you, if, like, 
Kim said, if you see me on LinkedIn, I've posted how the CIO office should be separate and equal to the CIO. And, and I'll go on a limb here. CIO might even want to report to the CISO. Because let's put it in perspective. Who defines the controls and the cybersecurity controls and the requirements? This guy. Right? So what does that mean? That means the CIO has to take those controls and implement them and tell us how they're going to implement it into their technology solutions. So a little backwards there, huh, when you think about it like that. How many times have your CI goes, hey, we're subject to, and some of them, it's not all of them, right, but there's scenarios where it happens. How many times have you worked for a technology leader that says, well, what are our requirements? Who's an app dev? Any app dev folks? Right? Okay, one. Wow, one. Hey, man. Keep up the fight. When I worked at Kentucky, we had 450 in-house developed applications. To further create that nuance, we had Deloitte, DXC, and then the state of Kentucky developers. And we were developing solutions for Medicaid, Medicare, connecting to the platform. And we, when I got there, I would tell you how much time we got. Okay, got little, I'll tell a little story. So I got there, and I, and I said, let me see your application development program. Let me see your methodolo methodologies, all that. So they were like, well, we're waterfall, brrr, build, build, build down the assembly line, nine months. And then at the end of nine months, they shot it over to the security team that was there before I got there. And they said, hey, we want to make sure our code's secure. Can you have it done by Friday? <laughs> Friday's the release date. I went, no. They said, well, before you got here, they did it in three hours. What did they do in three hours? Right? Do the hokey pokey and magic and the call. They got a cauldron out back, Harry Potter. Right? I came to find out that they had one lady who really, she worked in security. She had a hard time spelling security. And she had found a tool that did a SQL injection scan. So for the last 10 years in the state of Kentucky, they had been scanning code to these critical applications to the residents of Kentucky access for food supplement, child support, Medicaid, Medicare, adoption, and we could guarantee that they couldn't suffer from SQL injection. So we had a lot of work to do. We had to go back and check all this code. And I started showing them, but, but when I started talking to them, and I was like, SQL injection and code vulnerability and static and dynamic scanning, when I went that way, I think a few of them started drooling. They didn't understand what I was talking about, right? So we had to go back and talk to them in their language. And we said, let me tell you what, what's at stake here. Uh, how disrupted would it be if the f uh, food supplemental, or some people call them food stamps, right, or SNAP, how, how, how detrimental would that be if that system shut down for a day, for a week? Or how detrimental would it be because it's easily hackable, because SQL injection is not the only way to get in, if someone started diverting all those funds? Oh, yeah, that's bad, right? Yeah. All right. So we built in the security teams to those developers, right? We put governance in place. And here, here's your free hint for the day. I tried several steps with them. What worked for us in Kentucky was they had a PMO office. So we went to the PMO office and we said, here is what's required at a minimum to do secure coding and secure coding practices. Call them milestones. Build them into your PMO plan so when your project managers pick up a new development plan, those security requirements are now milestones. And we've already defined that you should be doing static and dynamic coding throughout, right? You should have these kind of injections and you have this testing and QA. Oh, here's some scripts during your QA testing that you can do. And as we perfected that, we reduced all our application development down by six months. So we were paying Deloitte and DEXC, big name vendors. Imagine how much money we saved there. That year, I quantified $20 million saving from what we did in security. And we reduced our time to deployment. And it was more secure. Nothing's 100% secure, but it was definitely more secure than making sure it didn't have a SQL injection for three hours. And at the end, we changed them. They still kind of stayed waterfall, but it went from a more agile and at the end, it wasn't, hey, can we have this big meeting now and everyone go through and make sure we get the ready to go live? Because we implemented these practices throughout of it, everyone else started doing it going, oh, you know what? That would work for us too. So when the developers got to the end of the development cycle and said, we're ready, it was ready. We didn't need any more review. 
It was gone. It had been tested. It was secure. It was out there, right? And we were saving money. So those are the kind of things that we have to start thinking about in cybersecurity is how do we implement this? This sitting in your seat and only looking at your screen. You also have to start helping your cybersecurity teams think about how their one small part relates and implements to the whole. So this is an old production thing. Um, if you're on an assembly line and your part is the, I, I'll, I'll do a story again. Had a guy that worked at Ford. He's like, Dennis, I got the best job in the world. He goes, I sit in this chair. It's a little stool. He said, the truck will come in front of me, and I got a buddy sitting there and two more right there. So you can imagine, it's the wheels, right? He goes, the truck stops. We stand up. We grab four bolts. And I sit back down. He does that all day long. I was like, not for me. But the whole thing is, that's, that's how we think about the way our cybersecurity program works. We've got the person that does their four bolts, right? But if they understand what's happening down here when the truck gets here, and they understand what happens over here before the truck gets to them, they're more impactful. Because if they go too slow putting the bolts on, or they put the bolts on wrong, right, or they use the wrong tire, it impacts the line and it causes problems. So if we can start working with our cybersecurity teams, and we know that our teams are overtasked, right? But if we can work with them and start explaining to them, here's why what your little thing does impacts those strategic goals. So now we're going back to that language again. You'll see a big change in productivity. You'll start seeing a change in the way they think and their strategy, and they'll start being more impactful. Next, future con. If I got to talk future, right? I've talked a lot about what we can do now to fix some things. And, there's, and th those, those things we need to fix, it's going to take time. They're future, right? But those are immediate things. But they will put, build that platform for future com. So who's read the latest uh, alert about quantum computing? Have you even seen it? Has anyone in here seen it? came out two months ago. So the federal government put out a notice about quantum computing that says, when quantum computing gets here, you're effed. That's the summary. That's the executive summary, right? But it talks about how quantum computing will break the way we do encryption now. Everything we know about encryption, when quantum computing, and it's, they're talking about 2024, it's out the window. So they were also generous enough to go, here's a list of things you can do to start getting ready for it. And so I, I, I've only seen one person raise their hand in here. We're behind, right? We're talking about the future. So... We have to start looking at how do we prepare for the future. And that just relates to business as well, is we're doing our cybersecurity right now, right? If you don't have a, a, a program and a framework you're following, start there. Because a lot of us are just working in that organized chaos. You're putting out fires, right? And we need to be proactive. But if you get yourself to that point where you're, you're stable, you're organized, you have a program, you can also start taking that common language and going, hey, you know, in 2024, quantum computing is going to be here. It's going to break the way encryption works. It's going to break this. It's going to facilitate that. It's going to facilitate hacking at higher speeds. Here's what we can start doing now. Start putting that into the budget. Start talking that common language. Because you could go back to that student enrollment. When quantum computing gets here, breaks encryption, we're not going to be able to enroll students. Right? Here's how we negate that. Here's how we get ready for it. And instead of going, in 2024, I need $3 billion to build a quantum computing lab, you can go, you know, I need a million dollars this year. I need 1.5 the next year. And those are more ingestible, too. And here's how that relates, and here's how those steps progress to it. Talent and acquisition. Right now, we know there's, there's always a gap. There are, the, the, the media propaganda tells us there's a million jobs, and there's only 500,000 of us. We've heard all those numbers, right? But how are we building our talent and ac acquisitions? Um, you hear, so this is one of those areas that it, people have different opinions. It's like anyone can get in cybersecurity. I call BS on that. It's the same as saying anyone can be a firefighter, anyone can be a policeman, right? Anyone can be an EMS. There's certain skills, there's certain acuum, there's certain attributes that it takes to be in cybersecurity. When I, I, I teach at five different colleges. I teach cybersecurity courses. And some of these students are not working in the industry yet. So when we talk about, well, what do you want to do in cybersecurity? Can anyone guess what the answer is? It's always the same answer. 
God, that's it, right? The sexy pen and tester, that's what I want to be. So in Kentucky, I was able to have an entry-level position, which I called cybersecurity analyst, and I jokingly said there's one requirement, can you spell cybersecurity? That's all I want you to do. And, of course, we'd get applicants that have been like, oh, yeah, I've, I've done this. I've taken these courses. That's great because now you're ahead of the game because there's only one requirement, spell cybersecurity. And they all went, I want to be a pen tester. So what I did with that analysis was every four weeks, they rotated. They went to the pen test team. I had a pen test team in Kentucky. Not everyone gets to have those. And they were scary. I never want those guys mad at me. Man, if those guys ever. And then I had a GRC team. I had a risk team, I had an incident response team. So in Kentucky, Kentucky operated under a $10 billion federal tax budget. So it was, it was easy to buy things. I spent $7 million on an Archer GS, GRC tool, and they didn't blink an eye. I was like, I want to buy that tool. How much is it? $7 million. Okay. Wow. Um, but because I had those robust teams, I was able to take that person that I hired every four weeks. So they all came in wanting to be pen testers, and guess what they left as? Not pen testers, Right. I, I would move them in. I, I had one person the first week in the pen test. He's like, I, 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 I want to do this. Mm -mm. I, I, this ain't me. I, don't, I didn't know this, right? Because they didn't realize that you got to write reports, <laughs> right? You got to quantify it back to risk, right? Right? You know, they did. They, they, no, uh -uh. they just wanted to hack, you know, they wanted to do the movie stuff. But they loved GRC, they had a natural attraction and ability in the GRC. And they became, one of, they became my lead GRC analyst in, in months, right? Um, so that's, that's what I mean. You can't, it's not for everybody. We, we tell people, you can come from anywhere. There's some great security practitioners and leaders that came from all industries. But I, I want us to, when we communicate to, this, to the society, it's like, it's not just you can come from anywhere, right? Here's some things you need to know. So career paths. Right? Spell out career paths. If you've ever been in the military, you, if, if you're enlisted or officer, but you start out as a private, right? And the military says, hey, if you want to be a Lance Corporal, you got to do this. And then once you get to Lance Corporal, you can look at the chart and it says, to be a corporal, you've got to go to these schools and you've got to meet these competencies. And they have career paths built out. And it's built out by whatever job you have, right? If you're a rifleman or uh, uh, someone who fuels trucks, you can look at that career path. That's missing for us. You know, there's, there's a lot of, lot of documentation out there now that says how to get into cybersecurity, but career paths. Because a lot of folks come in, pen tester, right? They don't know that there's 30 competencies under the umbrella of cybersecurity. And that's, that's our fault. That's our fault, right? Um, you know, the other things with, with looking at the future that, you know, I wanted to really hit on was building those, building those teams, building in diversity to those teams, you know, and it's not just, when we talk about diversity, everyone knows what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, like, diversity of thought. There's, there's a lot of folks out there that can look at a situation and go, uh, have you ever heard, the, it's, I like my military stories, there was a, a group of soldiers with a truck, and they were trying to put it into the garage, and it was a newly built garage, and the truck was too high. So you got all these senior leaders standing around, you know, doing this, and some private walks up and goes, you know, if you let the air out of the tires, it'll be lower and it'll go right in. And that's the way we have to think. Sometimes security is difficult. We know the challenges of not having a budget, so sometimes we've got to be that guy that goes, eh, let the air out of the tires a little bit. We're in there, right? And you can go, oh, that was free, but when can I have my raise, right? So, right, promotion. So with that, I'm sure I could talk, I could talk for hours. I love to talk, especially to my community. But I want to pause and, and let's engage. So what's your questions? What's your thoughts? Do we need a microphone out in the audience? Maybe. Okay. Oh, you didn't know the microphone, it's a toss, right? So you throw it and you got to catch it. And then the next person, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Anyone? Yes. So what do you find is the best way to... What do you find is the best way to keep employees? You know, it's a partnership with the organization. So I can control my teams, 
right? I can motivate them. I can say, hey, you work from home. Oh, you got to go to a doctor's appointment. Oh, waste that PTO time. Just, just keep your phone on, right? You can, you can motivate your teams and build morale. Um, but you really have to partner with the organizations. You have to have an understanding of what they're willing to pay. So, you know, right now in my previous job, higher education. Anyone else that works in higher ed here? Yeah, notoriously low salaries. It just is. So how do, I, how do I compensate that? One, I make sure your work's meaningful. I make sure you have clear direction on what you're doing. If, if, you don't, if it's confusing when you come into work or it's frustrating or you feel like you're chasing fires, that's, you're gone. I'm losing you. You're gone, right? So I have to make sure that I do that. If I can't get you raises, an organization don't offer bonuses, I can at least go, let's get you some money with training because most organizations have training. I believe in training highly, right? And going back to getting into the field, we hear folks argue about degrees, certifications. Those are great. Every degree I've ever got, I didn't do it for my job. I did do it for my job, but not my job. I did it for me, right? But it also gives me an advantage. So if, if I'm equal to someone trying to get a job and I have a PhD and they don't, and that's the only thing different, maybe that gives me the advantage, right? Certifications. So you see HR says, we've got to have CISSP. Every job now has to have CISSP, right? Every job, entry-level job, CISSP. They don't even understand. You've got to have five years of cybersecurity before you can get to CISSP, but HR says you've got to have CISSP, right? Um, but get, looking at you and saying, okay, what is it that you want to accomplish with your cybersecurity career? And then going, okay, here's the training, our conferences, that we'll pay for that helps you get there, be it with us or not. I, I don't stay, we, we don't live in the society anymore where you work 40 years at a company and you retire. It's naive, right? Most of these companies that once everybody come back to the office, they're the next Sears. They're going to be gone anyway. So we're going to be looking for new jobs because they'll shut down, right? So I'm making sure that your career is going the path you want to go. It is my intent as a CSO to leave a legacy and a string of CISOs. I've got two behind me now. People that used to work for me that are now CISOs. So I'll make sure that you have that. So it is money in your pocket. It's not money that you can spend, pay your bills with, because that's what, bottom line, that's what we all work for. But it is money in your pocket because I'm paying for certifications. Those go in your name. You can put those on your resume. You can put them on your LinkedIn page, and you can land your next job, right? There was, I forget who says it, but, you know, train them, train them good enough where they can leave, but treat them good enough where they'll stay. I believe in that. I mean, that, that's 100%, right? But it's also why the military, and went, like, again, I said, who, if you're in the military, you change duty stations about every three years. You don't stay with the same unit for four years, four years most, right? Unless you're, like, in the reserves, then you stay forever, stay 100 years. But that's the whole idea of that, right? Good, good question. Appreciate it. Absolutely. So... I think it's two separate things, but it's relatable. So everything we do in cybersecurity is interrelatable. So if you remember my story about teaching everyone how their part affects the whole, right? So most of our Internet of Things come from a third-party vendor. We procure that, right? So the problem and the challenges of Internet of Things is one set of issues. They're not done very securely. There's no standards. We're starting to get there. So you have to understand that part and address that. I've always developed an Internet of Things program, right, like a medical device security program. The third-party vendor risk side of it is a small portion of organizational risk. So, again, every organization I've been at doesn't do it or doesn't do it well, and we work on it and we improve it while we're there. But how do we as a cybersecurity department relate to third-party vendor risk? Well, we should have an intake I prefer it to be through one gate at procurement. So that's one problem, right? A lot of organizations have many ways to, reset, to request procurement or third parties. So you got to work with your procurement team or contract team or whatever they're called in your organization and go, we need one gate in, one gate out. Now, cybersecurity needs to be at the front of that, and IT needs to be at the front of that. So you develop, in an ideal situation, I'd have a whole group of architects, and that's what they did all day long, every day. So when a request came in, you'd have the security architect run off and go, I'm going to conduct a, a security third-party risk assessment on this group or person or, or tool or whatever it is, software or hardware. 
and come back with, here is the security risk. Here's the mitigation of those risks. Here's the recommendation of those risks. How do we, rec- how do we mitigate it? Or get a hell no, right? Oh, hell no, they ain't buying this, right? And in concordance, and in, in, in the same time, IT should be going, are we trying to put a round peg in the square hole? So that's the first step. Is this viable? We have all the risks now. We know if it'll work or interface or what we got to do to make it work or what we got to do to make it safe. I've worked with vendors through a third-party risk where we was like, mm-mm. And they're like, what can we do to make it right? And they did it. So we stuck with them, right? They turned into a business partner, and they showed us progression. They're like, you identified this. We fixed it. Here, you want to validate it? And then we have other ones that's like, you got to sign an NDA. We're not sure. Yeah, so, so, right. So, but it's, it, it has to tie into the organizational part. You, and you have to do that common language. You go, third-party risk management's important, but it don't live in security. When I, when I developed the third-party risk management program in, in Kentucky, we didn't own it. I said, here's how my team plays into it, but that belongs to you all. Here, procurement, you're the third-party risk vendor management because there's so much more to that than just the security aspect. Yep. used to be a, a clear understanding as to the need for IT and security functions to be distinct and separate, mm-hmm. um, at least back in the day. And nowadays, it seems to me that they are becoming more of an embedded yes. uh, uh, type of segment or so within organizations. Can you speak as to what that, why that trend may be and uh, how conflict of interest is being handled along, the, uh, along that? And if you feel like that's the trend that will continue. Good question. And everyone heard that, right, about how IT and cybersecurity is interrelated. Okay. Yeah. Did you? Oh, okay. Um, I just didn't make sure you need clarification. So, um, so there was, there's that progression. We have to go back to legacy, right? So there was a time in IT where cybersecurity was like, what's that? It wasn't as important, right? And as the industry's grown, we've evolved. So as we talk about future state, and we talked about how we tie things together, in my opinion and some of my observations, I, t- I tell my security teams when I come in as a new leader, is like, we really are governance. Cybersecurity really is governance. We should not be configuring servers. We should be telling you what controls to put in place asking the IT department, how are you going to meet that control, and then validating it. We know in the real world, sometimes we have to do a lot of work, right? And I'm talking about that part of it. So cyber operations and incident response we're talking about. We're talking about the IT function. So I want to make sure I'm answering your questions. You also come from the legacy part of we had org charts. Everyone loves org charts, right? So it's like, where do I fall on the org chart? So when we had those scenarios where CISOs report to the CIO, you'll notice that the security one's probably a small column and then you got, right? If you heard in my, in my introduction, I was the CTO and the CISO at UT. So I had, I can't remember, 10, 15 cybersecurity people. But when I became the CTO, I had 250 extra people, right? It's disparate, <laughs> right? Is that, it, it, how do, if you tell me my EHR takes 400 people to run Epic, and then you assign two security people to it, right? Don't match. It takes 400 people to keep it going, but that don't, 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 don't make sense. But that integration you're talking about is one of those future states. And I think it's a, I think it's a progress to which we talk about of how do we define and separate the duties and responsibilities. I don't know it's perfect because I've toyed with it, but I have two concepts. So when I was a CTO, it was like, here's your... Here's your IT org chart, server admins, network, telecom, right? I went, but we have five business functions. So why don't we buy, build five IT teams, like research IT? A lot of resources, a lot of people need it. And you might have a network guy um, and, and the team and build those in, right? The other one with yours is 
we look at IT and go, got to meet that control. How are you going to do it? Well, why not give them the operations? So that's a chance to integrate a little bit. And we talk about building security in everywhere. You can go, okay, security operations lies under the CTO. So when you build these servers, we're going to tell you what the requirements are, but it's your job to run that operation, right? If the servers goes down, does security rush out and troubleshoot it? Then why, are, why, why not put it at the CTO, right? But then the security governance says, hey, while you're troubleshooting, here's what you need to do to determine if it's a nefarious act or it's just junk, right? And then have the playbooks. So that, I think that's where some of that goes, if that answers your question. So how that's starting to integrate, because it makes sense, right? And it's breaking those silos. Yeah. Dr. Lieber, we have some virtual questions. Okay. Like to get to. Uh, this is from uh, Rajiv V. Which area in the future would be the most managed using AI and ML? Everywhere. That's a short answer, right? Everywhere. Anywhere that we can use machine learning or, or AI is going to benefit us. Anywhere where that we can automate is going to benefit us. I mean, that's just, we, we're understaffed. We're under budgeted. So who, who's ever worked in a SOC? Right? All the noise. And how do you manage that down? Um, I'm not promoting anyone, but CrowdStrike, right? If you ever use CrowdStrike as your EDR, they do a lot of stuff automated for you. That makes life easy. It does. So how do you do that? So. I think no, we got no. one back here. And how many you uh, got? Yeah, uh, okay. I have one more, but... Okay. How, what, what have you found to be the most effective pipeline of hiring cybersecurity folks in or building them? What, what is, in your experience, how you've found good people? Internally, mm -hmm. right? Service desk. Um, I've got a lady now at my current organization. She works in privacy and compliance. She's like, I want to be in cybersecurity. And we, we collaborate on a lot of investigations through the privacy. Uh, it's, it's internal. Those are... Because it, it's seen as a promotion in most organizations, especially like if you're on the service desk. Um, and you should be developing them. So one of the things I do at my service desk is I create templates. I was like, how much stuff can I teach the service desk that's cybersecurity related to do and take care of on that phone call that alleviates my team? So you, you'll identify those internal. Yeah. I, I'd say internally is still the best. Yeah. Do you have one more? This is from Cara, Cara C. What would you recommend to incorporate your acquired entities into the environment so that risk to the business is understood? Uh, what was the acquired identities? What do you recommend to incorporate your acquired entities into the environment? Acquisitions. I oh, got gotcha. you. Okay. Um, it starts before the acquisition. So I've, I've had an opportunity to do this with a four organization, few organizations that buy people. Um, you should have a full security assessment of that organization before you buy them, right? And then you have strategic discussions that aren't made by us. Are they going to be a separate entity, like a holding group, or are they becoming us, right? If they're becoming us, it's easy. If we're at DennisLieber.com and you used to be at Joe.com, everybody's going to be at DennisLieber.com now. Sorry. Right. If it's a holding group, then you have that centralized management. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, uh, I hope I answered that for him. Kind of generalized, but yeah. Anything else? Yes, sir. <laughs> How do you go about facilitating uh, a culture change in your uh, environment? Fire everybody. You fire <laughs> everybody, <laughs> and you rebuild it. It's the easiest. <laughs> That's, that's the, Sometimes no, it feels that yeah, way. Um, you know, culture change, change management in general is hard. It takes time. You got to have a you got to have a strategic goal. So you have to have a stated end point desire, and that's where it starts. So if you go, this is what we do now. This is how what we need to be doing, and then you have to have the information in between there of how we're getting there. Some change can happen overnight. There's, there's some, you know, you have authority and you have someone who's like, we ain't doing that no more. No blue shirts at conferences anymore. You're done, right? Easy one. But if we've been wearing blue shirts to conferences for 20 years, it may not be that easy. And you have stakeholders. You have internal stakeholders that you're like, they're not the CEO. I'll tell you, like working in higher ed, you have a lot of tenured professors 
and researchers that if they ain't happy, it ain't happening. One person changed the whole organization. We talk about, we don't change IT or security controls for a small demographic. You know, we ain't going to change something that affects 200 people because we have 5,000 people. But there's always that, there's that one person who's like, we're changing it. It's changing. You got to have that common language that we talked about. You got to have, and you got to build consensus. There's a lot of work that happens behind the, behind the scenes, right? So when I'm going to do something new, some organizations have committees. Some organizations means you've got to be smart enough to go out and run who those people are and those stakeholders, and you socialize it. You get them on your side. You show them the benefit, and they might get mad at first. I've had them. They're, they're mad. They don't understand it. I know IT better than you. Really? And you let them go fail, and then you come back and go, okay, yeah, I, I see now, right? Uh, and you, it, it just takes time. It's, a, it's, a, it's not even a science. It's like theater, right? It's politics uh-huh. at the end of it. Or you could fire everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Two minutes. Okay. I'm being told we've got two minutes. Talk fast. Well, I have a fun <laughs> question. Okay. Um, so everyone at the bar loves hearing tall tales and big fish stories about cybersecurity. Yeah. Are tall tales and big fish stories effective means of communication in the boardroom? Uh, like Equifax was hacked into because the firewall's password was admin admin. Are those, are those effective stories? FUD hardly work. I'll put it back to you. Has it worked to this point? It hasn't, has it, right? So if we can relate it back to that story, it's like, hey, Equif- or if, you're, and if your board asks, it's better. Are you, right? Hey, Equifax was just hacked. Does that affect us? They don't want all that you just said. Even when you go password, admin, admin, they don't know that. What? What's that? They want to guess? No. And if it's a no, they want to go, what are you doing about it? Right? And that's where you had that common language. Um, they're good stories, right? It's like world's dumbest criminals. That's why those shows are good, right? These great stories, but they're not effective. And, and, I, and I go back to that statement. It ain't worked to this point. It's, it's, not, it's not working, right? We've got to change it. Well, I think it's my time. Thank you all for listening to me. I appreciate it. I always love meeting my security folks. <laughs>